All right, Spin TV family, as promised, we have the third of three, the final nine. It's come down to this. 90 holes have been played at the 2014 Japan Open out at Nasu Highland Golf Club. And I have here with me somebody who was part of this, who played well enough all weekend to earn a spot on this vaunted card. I've got Dave Feldberg here. Welcome, man. How you doing, James? This final nine is going to start on hole 18, and it has a pretty unique format. It's going to play 18, 1, 2, 17, 18, and then cycle again, 1, 2, 17, 18. Uh, this was so the spectators could have a good view. It never got too far from the clubhouse, and it uh, adds some interesting elements to this round, which Dave is going to lend his insight to. All right. Hole 18, you remember it from the fifth round. It is a par three, it's 100 meters. You've got that bunker sitting right in front of the pin, which you look at it because of the angle it sits on. And the rain started to fall, Dave. So what's the challenge of this hole right here? Um, the challenge is just to make sure you don't throw it in the bunker. You know, if people have seen the Japan Open in the past, this is the bunker I threw in to lose the 2010 Japan Open on the final hole. So you gotta stay away from it, it's very dangerous. And how much was that in your mind? Four years removed, they haven't had this tournament, you come back, you make this final card, what are you thinking about right here as your I'm, tee? I'm thinking throw it to the right of the basket, make sure you get a good skip, and it seems like that's what the other two players are thinking. Definitely, you see, everybody's gonna opt for a backhand hyzer approach here. They're gonna err on it, leaving it wide. And if you remember, Macbeth lost two strokes on 17 and two strokes on 18 to come into this final nine, five behind Ricky. Nico was four behind and Dave was six. So Paul's got some work to do and he puts one right near the pin. He makes it easy for me to copy his line. Paul was clutch there. He was not gonna lay up like the other two gentlemen. He wanted to make a stroke early and make a statement. And that's definitely what his caddy was telling him to do right before the round. And I heard Steve Rico saying, draw blood, go for it early. And uh, when you're in fourth place on a final nine, you know you can't get fit. So how much more aggressive are you going to play than maybe the first or second place person? Completely aggressive. All out. I'm going to give it everything I have. If I'm here where Ricky's at, I'm trying to make it. But Ricky surprisingly lays up. Not in his blood, but I think he's ready to win. He's ready to be a champion. And he does have that cushion lead, so the layup does make sense, even though he's known for going for those big putts. Paul is going to sneak one in over the top of the cage right there and pick up that birdie, getting a stroke early. He puts the pressure on me here. These, these putts aren't easy with 150 class. And uh, Paul led the way, and I followed him, and we drew blood. Definitely not easy, especially when you factor in the rain and the fact that you've already played around today, so fatigue has to be a factor at some point. We'll see some cleanups here on hole 18, and we're going to move to a much tougher hole. We've got hole one, 279 meters, par four, OB on the right, tree line on the left, and now you've got a gallery watching. What's the added pressure of a really tight drive with a gallery at your back? Um, you want to show off. And you know, the first time I ever got to the hole, Sam Farron said to me in the final nine, make the disc look small, like Paul tried to do here. Make it look real small, get it way down there, but he didn't put enough air on it, and it dropped out on him. And there's definitely, on these downhill par fours, which this course is known for having, you have that risk reward factor. If you go high and get the distance, you may go right, you may tail out left, or you could play it short and uh, down the middle with a little lower shot. And I I'm surprised as you see Ricky here and uh, you'll see Nico, they're both throwing way left, throwing this Anheuser line they didn't use during the round. I think they're feeling the pressure already on the second hole saying, I can't throw out of bounds. You definitely don't want to throw out of bounds and, and make uh, somebody like Dave or Paul think they have a chance to get in that window, especially when they birdie the first hole. So here's Paul's chance. He looks like he puts a good move on it, but you know, this hole struggled. He had two fives during the regular tournament, and now he's gonna start with a five again, it looks like. And you can see he lost his footing a little bit there. The conditions definitely affecting everybody's strategy. What did you do during this whole tournament to deal with these weather, these wet conditions? I did what you have to do with 150 class in general, which is slow down. It's the best advice Ken Climbwell ever gave me or my friends. Slow down. Disc golf's played too fast. Slow your shot down, slow your footwork down, and uh, you'll make better shots and you won't slip. And it's, it was no stranger uh, to the fact that everybody found out of bounds at some point in this tournament, so you know it's going to happen, and that's great advice. You just keep it in bounds as much as possible, understand that mistakes are going to happen, as you'll see coming up in some of these holes, and you just let it go. I thought that shot was parked. Me and Ken thought that was parked. It's a very difficult, challenging hole. Definitely challenging. Paul's going to run this long putt. Looking good. Heiser's out a little bit early, giving Dave a chance here to make up some more Whoops, strokes. Whoops, almost fell. Oh, I held it. Wow, that was close. <laughs> held it, chained it, making some more strokes, getting strokes in the first two holes is a great way to put pressure on a final nine. Is there a different mental strategy um, that you have going into maybe your last round? You came up from the chase card in your fifth round. How do you play knowing that there's nine more? 
Um, I, I just wanted to play to attack and I wanted to look flashy doing it. The flashier you look and the stronger you look and, and I was trying to look focused in my face so when they looked at me they knew, uh oh, this might be a battle. I'm not to walk this in, I'm gonna have to play. And definitely somebody uh, with your experience ha winning this tournament before and, and playing here for many years and some of these guys are, you know, Ricky and Paul, they, they haven't been here before. They're learning how to play these holes and play this tournament in particular. We're gonna move on to hole two. You guys will remember it's another very tough par four. It's 273 meters. And this one of the baskets tucked to the right up on a hill and you've got the cart path behind it to the right. At this point, I'm feeling it in my throw and I threw a little low and I really thought this was gonna get the flex. They did all weekend and it flexed, but I think it caught the little hill right there. And that's a terrible position to be on this hole. It is tough when you're playing up against that road. We did manage to stay in bounds. Here comes the first mistake out of Ricky. I thought it was gonna come back for him, and now he's opened the door. This is the first, like you said, the first mistake of the final nine, and this is a spot where you, you can't give players like Nico or Paul Macbeth or even Dave Feldberg, you cannot give them a chance uh, to think they can be get back in this. Nico catches a huge break, he turns it low, and instead of going out of bounds like Ricky, it cut rolls back to the middle. And Paul is gonna take the green destroyer that he's been throwing all weekend. He's gonna actually keep it high, challenge the tree, get the advantage of going forth off the box. You get to read what the wind is doing and how the conditions are playing. And Perfect drive, I puts thought. Puts a nice shot, very nice shot into the fairway. And uh, Nico, is, he's a little short on his drive, so this is a tough upshot. I mean, I'm scared of this upshot. That OB is right behind it, hills on both sides. And this looks perfect from our angle. Even he thinks it's perfect, and it's still 50 short. That's one of the challenges of these big par fours and throwing 150 class discs. Is you really got to put up. a move on these upshots, not only with accuracy, but distance as well, if you want to have a look at birdie. Now, Ricky doesn't get up and down here from there, and I'm surprised. With the sidearm, I thought he'd get much closer, and I think now there's an opening, so I go for the aggressive line here. Yeah, tell me about this decision, playing the backhand towards the out-of-bounds. I thought that at the worst I would touch the grass up there and take the putt for the 4P away from the out-of-bounds, which was makeable, but instead uh, they say down there we didn't touch and I had to take it back, and it was probably the turning point. I, I was making a move right there and thought I had a chance to win the tournament still. It was definitely a very aggressive shot, and then you bust out a forehand, and I, I can honestly say, I've known you a few years now, I, I can't say I've ever seen you throw a forehand. It looks pretty smooth on tape. I, I didn't know I could overthrow it. Usually I have a short forehand, but with the 150 class, all it takes is a little flick of the wrist and you can get it down there. You definitely got behind the pin, which is the safer way to play back, so it's uh, not, not a terrible mistake to make at all. But you can't even run putts like this out here. It's so dangerous. We had to lay these up. You never see me and Paul lay up from 35 feet. Yes. Yeah. It's dangerous. Definitely not. Even Ricky's gonna lay up here since he's got that cushion lead. But I, here's Nico. He's, I thought he was gonna lay this up at first, and then I was like, he, he's gonna go for this. He does go for it, and you know, money in the bank. Nice, like they say, drive for show, putt for dough, and you're gonna end on top many, many all top week, cards. All week he made putts like that. Him and Ricky were slashing putts in the basket all week from 30, 35 feet. And I said it before, and I'll say it again in this video, when you putt like that, and when Ricky Wasaki putts like that, like he did in Texas this year, he's hard to beat. And he's yeah. gonna continue in to the fourth hole with still a good cushion. We're gonna go to hole 17, another par four, a lot of par fours, on this final nine, which allows for multiple stroke swings to happen. when Whereas you don't see in normal disc golf two stroke swings happening on a lot of holes, it really opens it up. It happens distance. here, and I think that at this point, Nico's thinking he has a chance to win, and he goes for the big shot off this tee with the big roller. I thought it was a very dangerous decision, and instead of making a run to win, he puts him back, self back in the same position, OB, like Ricky was on the last hole. So let's talk about this. We're, we're on the fourth hole, you've got five to go. And uh, Ricky's not really making too many mistakes. What What's going through your mind at this point? At this point, after I took that big number, I think, well, Ricky's out of range. Now it's a battle for three men to see who can get second, third, and fourth. And after he, you know, Nico Stone will be there, I think there's an opening. But with shots like Ricky's throwing right here, you know, his release seems off right now at this moment. And I'm thinking, these guys in front of me aren't thinking it's over yet. So that's good for me because they're chasing, leaving me a chance to maybe gain a stroke if they make a mistake chasing Ricky. Definitely a couple different strategies that uh, people are playing on this final nine. And uh, you know, land nicely in the fairway. And Ricky's got a pretty tough upshot to a green. It looks like he's gonna lay up here. Yeah, he's playing him. a game that I'm not used to seeing, but this is the maturing player of Ricky Wysocki. He's learning how that he doesn't need to make every shot to win. He needs to not make mistakes. As we saw Paul Macbeth on the fifth round take a big number on this because of this tricky green. I think Ricky saw that and has learned from that. You can 
This green can make or break a lot of people. Tell me about the challenges of this particular hole. Well, this green is on the right. They put this rock up here. It seems like it's designed for disc golf, even though it's for ball golf. And if you don't make it over the rock, you take a very big chance of going back into the bunker OB. A lot of players hit off the rock or save into the bunker. It just depends on your luck at that point. But if you're a good player like Paul is here, you're going to throw it over the rock the whole way and never risk it. And then you've got, it's up on the crest of the hill, and Paul actually hits the rock, but I guess we call that world champ love, flash yep. in the ring, right? Yep, it definitely hits the rock, gets through, and, you know, that's the kind of things you need to have to be in the finals like this. You have to have the, it working for you. And sometimes it's a little bit of luck that helps the skill, but, you know, we call it the shooter's roll. And Nico stays on fire with that putter, doesn't he? Yeah, he just keeps hitting these big putts, and he's pressing. He actually took second place away from Paul in that four-stroke swing on those last two holes of the fifth round, and he doesn't want to give it back. It doesn't look like he is, and it looks like to me Paul's surprised by this. He thinks that, you know, he was going to make a big run, and he's surprised that he's having a fight just to, you know, maintain third position. Definitely a fatigue I almost in. missed that. Slipped out of my hand. It's, it's wet out there, and those discs are light. It's wet out there. You've played 90-something holes in the past 72 hours. Uh, what this tournament compared to other tournaments, how does fatigue factor in? Um, it was very tiring, you know, with the, the time changes and the playing all day and the weather. Whew, even as a young man, I, I struggled with it. But as an old man coming to this tournament, I could see that it takes a passion of a 20-year-old to stay in it. Yeah, it's <laughs> definitely something that, you know, disc golfers, you have to have stamina to play in this tournament and in these conditions. You can see it on the face. So of see, everybody. Paul, this is why I think Paul's number one in the world right now. You see the consistency? He mimicked his line within a foot. And why I'm still able to hang with the kids is I could still mimic his line within a foot. And we were able to throw very similar shots on the same hole. And that's just a signature Paul Macbeth Heiser that he, like you said, he's able to mimic. And you're looking at that line and said, okay, let's go. Let's get it. Now, let's see. These are why Nico is one of the best, him and Ricky, is that after those poor shots the first time through, look, easy adjustment for a top professional. And tell me about that. So you see somebody who is throwing so consistent and you need to make that adjustment. As as a professional, you know, what do you tell yourself? How do you pep yourself up to say, okay, I can do that better? Well, because with us, we're, we don't do distances. Most of us, we do by feel. So if he was 30 right like they were last time, they can just feel, a, they can feel that change and make that change on the next shot. And if you let us play a hole twice in a row like this, most of the top 10 in the world will be able to make easy adjustments and get closer to the basket. And I brought this up earlier in one of the previous videos that I call it the four digit separator. When if you have to make these uh, particular shots and you're worried about it, you know, you're worried about the tight OB or you're worried about having to throw the same shot you already threw, you're probably not thousand rated, but the thousand rated guys, they look at that as an opportunity. Yeah, craving. If I only get to play a hole once and I miss it, I'm, I'm upset. I want to play a tournament where I get to play a hole more than once so I can make that adjustment and then I can still shoot under on that hole. And that's a great little bit of advice. We're going to finish up hole 18. We've got one more round to make. We're going to go back to hole one. Very interesting that we're going back to hole one again. I've never done this. You know, I've been in final nines all over the world. And at first I was a little, hmm, I don't know about this, but it was kind of interesting. It was enjoyable. We played, you know, the gallery got to watch us the whole time. And, and like you said, I was able to get better and better on the holes as we went by. And you get to repeat that shot. You get to try new lines, push Paul it a little bit. Paul can't further. get off the tee here. He, this hole has got his number. It's, Look at him. He, you can see you never see him like that. It's really got his number. It was tough. Paul, not somebody who usually shows a whole lot of emotion during a round. And you could tell he was frustrated all day during the fifth round and during the final nine with uh, what was happening. But, you know, you got to keep playing through it. And let's talk about that. You know, how do you keep yourself in it? You know there's not a lot of time left. You've just got to power through it. What are you telling yourself? You're telling yourself, keep throwing your best shots, dig deep. You know, you, you're here for a reason. So show the crowd what you're made of and hopefully it'll be your time. And like Ricky right there, you can see he relaxed after the last couple holes after making that birdie and he launched his longest drive on this hole right down the center and he, he made the adjustment that needed to be if you're going to win the tournament. And there's a big difference when you come down to these last few holes and having only a couple stroke lead and having that nice cushion. It definitely takes something off your mind. Oh, there's a nice dodge by the spectator right there and not get hit by the disc. Paul was just trying to get safe. I don't think he wanted to be in the bunker again. And this is one of the better shots I saw out of Nico for the final nine. You know, I know he made a lot of nice putts, but to keep a 150 this long in the air and stalling like this and not go OB, fantastic play. That's definitely that's definitely a professional level shot right there. You could see the, the extended follow through in order just to keep that disc from heisering and put it just long enough to have a putt. Ricky was really playing smart and safe and his disc was getting great skips out of that short grass. He was playing it smart. I tried to adjust, you know, 
throw it a little shorter than last time so I didn't have to make a, a 35 footer and I hit a great right there there's a little hole I hit it I landed in it you see it there where Paul's at and I skipped off it Paul's gonna lay up with, and put it and it rolls over the hill which it was really surprising now he's facing up making a pot for a five and this hole is just really eating at him Ricky wants to put it away right now for the three and that's a that's a really uh, common design element of these courses is putting the whole the pins up on these little undulations where you've got to really pay attention to how your disc lands. So uh, tell me a little bit about that challenge. Well, you can see as Nico airballed it there, it puts a pressure on every shot. If you know if you don't hit metal, you're in trouble. And here I can't get my left foot on the ground. I'm trying to put off one leg uphill. Very difficult. I, I lifted my body and went too high. So the challenge of those hills is difficult. And I think Paul's feeling the pressure here. This is big putt for him. And I think if he doesn't make this, which he does, he he could have trouble finishing the night. And that's one of those just moments where you, you know the guy's a two-time world champion for a reason because you can he can have a mistake and he can come back and make a great putt to combo. It was clutch right in the heart. And, and Nico right here, unbelievable. You know, he missed that putt the first time around. And that was for a three, this was for a four. It seems like he puts a little pressure on himself for the birdie, but there he knows he has to make it and he comes through. And uh, Ricky's going to tap in for his four. All he has to do is par out to win. I mean, tell me about being in that mental position. You just have to par to win. Is that more pressure or is that less pressure? It's more pressure because the way, that, like you said, with these hills and all the OBs, I had that position and I was just trying to get pars and that, those discs will get up and walk away out there and they'll roll into bunkers and you'll have to make putts. You definitely find some unexpected uh, skips, rolls, trickles, things like that, that they react very differently than their max weight counterparts. It would be very interesting to see this tournament played with one, uh, 175 oh max weight Oh my god, I, I don't know. I think that the disc would go so far down those mountains we might never find them again. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with some of the power that all these guys have. Again, he won't let go of it in the middle and he's playing these extra safe shots. This time, he gets down there a little further. He's definitely, he's, he's been about the same position that he was last time as they approach uh, hole two once again, and uh, Ricky's gonna correct. Oh, beautiful adjustment. I mean, this is where you know that the tournament's over in my mind. And he really has nailed that high hyzer flip break over to fade, and you can see that the distance he's getting on his drives is is top caliber even for, you know, this level of player. Yeah, I mean, I'm doing my best to get just behind him. He's, uh, I'm following him around, he's now got the line. He's the player I'm following now. And it, I think this is the moment for Paul McBeth in the nine and he nuts it that's right down perfect. the center. And that's a great adjustment. You see everybody else take a very high route and he pins it right in the middle, a little lower, getting it to the ground, staying where you want to be looking at the hill from the right angle on your Doesn't it look like Nico's made the adjustment this time and thrown it even further so he's going to be right under it this time, right? Again, not even close. It's such deception. The mm. par four challenges and the sucker pins have really got, they just, they take a lot out of you. And tell me about that mentally. So twice in a row, you're throwing that shot and uh, it's just not getting there, you know. Do you make the adjustment or do you just tell yourself keep throwing? Just keep throwing because you know that if you juice up too much there, it's OB. So he's, you know, he'd rather be short. And just like with me here, I'm facing it. I have to hit a little tiny gap and I nick the leaves out. And I know it's short, but short's safe and long is real bad. And that's, mm -hmm. a, that's a great shot out of there. The trees were in the line and you just had to find that little window and get it out safe. And this is how you knew Rick is going to win. Look, he's underplayed it, but with the perfect angle, so it rolls right up to the pin. That's a great... That's a great little skip roll up there, just making his putt a little bit easier. Getting a little more confidence going into these last couple holes. Another layup. More layups. A lot of layups this weekend. So he just made this putt for maybe 10 feet or closer last time around. And uh, I thought maybe he'd put this in. Put a lot of pressure on him, but he got a bad break roll away here. Oh, no but problem. it's stuck. Should be no problem for Nico the way he's been putting. I and thought if I don't make this putt right here. This is what I was thinking. I have no chance to get anything but fourth, so I gotta put this in even if there's a cliff behind it. It's a big opportunity and you know that's that's another reason why you're a world champion. That's a great putt, putting it right in the chains. All and, week uh, I laid those up to get in to make the finals and that was my first attempt to try to make one. I was surprised to win it myself. And everybody's gonna tap in right here and we're gonna go on to the last two holes. Holes we've seen before. Another par four. If you don't remember, it's 185 meters. 606 feet long. You've got the cart path that's going to play OB, and my bet is we're going to see Nico throw another roller here. Yeah, I, I, I am going to be surprised if he throws a roller here in my mind at this point when we're driving down the cart. I'm thinking, what are they going to do on this hole? How do I have to play it? Me and Climo are talking as he's my caddy, and he's saying, get the four, and you'll have a chance to get you know third. That's what we're thinking. So again, I put it right down the middle. I really had this drive figured out. You just got to put it right in the middle, play it safe, 
and then get up and down on that tight green and then you have the then you have the opportunity for a three, but you can play it short of the rock, have a pitch over, and still look at a four very easily. Ricky here switches to the forehand, and in my mind, he was saying, I'm not pulling a Felder from 2010. You won't beat me. I'll take a four from this side. I'm not taking a five from the other. And he definitely he gets a little fortunate roll out of those trees. It looked like it was penetrating and then just back spun right out, and that's the moments when you know it's it's your tournament to win, and you just got to go out and take it. So now he over turns, and I think he's made another mistake, but it hops over the road, and finally he gets it to work out for him. And this this is a big play for him. If that doesn't work out, I don't think he finishes second. And that's a that is a great play. He was practicing it all. He he hit the cart path uh, in the fifth round, and then didn't get it overturned on the first time around and he finally corrects and gets that shot. And if you notice in Paul here, he's throwing the last few drives really low. He's going to make sure he's in bounds now. He, he feels the opportunity that he just has to keep it in bounds and play smart shots and he's going to you know be able to stay in his position or move up. You can definitely see that his focus has shifted. The style of shots that he's throwing has shifted. He's playing for position. You're he, playing for position. This so shot this is me, the battle. He closed me right here. That was the shot over the rock. Pretty AVR shot up the middle. I, I have nothing to say other than great shot. I reached for my Cenus. I gave it my best effort, and I put it up high so it had a chance to at least make land. And uh, as designed, rolls back into the bunker. Wasn't a good enough shot. And that's a tough green right there. We've been talking about it all tournament, and it, it's definitely uh, been a position decider coming down Nico this stretch. Nico clutches up right here. This disc, he clutched up all weekend, this black disc, and again, he's clutched right up to the basket. And both of them just closed me out right there and said, we'll battle for second. All right, Ricky's just going to lay up here, like we said, just play a, par golf. Going to have five for the last hole, four for the last hole. He's he's smiling now. Now we got him smiling. Now they, I have this OB here. I know I'm OB. In my mind, I'm OB. But I'm just trying to make a precedent. You know, a lot of people push the rules this weekend about where the grass goes into the bunker, and I just want to make a precedent for the future that we have to start not believing that way and just see the integrity of lines and play them as OBs. Now I can see you're upset on that, and you just that's that's that putt you just wanted to make. Yeah, I just wanted to say to the people, you know, I'll take my OB, but let's all start taking our OBs and play by the game and self-govern ourselves a little more And Nico's, the future. Nico's going to hit his putt. These should be tap-ins right here. And there's really not a whole lot left to do but shake hands and and say good round. I mean, what what are your overall thoughts on this tournament, and are you looking forward to 2016? Oh yes, I'm looking forward to 2016. This was my first year competing with the Latitude brand on the products at this tournament, and they performed well for me, but I need more experience with them, just like I did it. I came here the first time with the Nova, I took fourth, and then, then I moved up to first, and I'm hoping that I can you know, reach for that in 2016, probably my last year to play Open without a Masters next to my name. And it's, it's definitely been a long grinder tournament. Are you a fan of tournaments that have this many rounds packed that tight? Or what's When I was, when I was the three of their age, I was. I wanted more golf. The more golf meant more skill meant I'd win in the end. But uh, as I get younger, I prefer the uh, one-round-a-day setup. The one-round-a-day setup is traditional uh, in disc golf and in golf as well. But, you know, sometimes you, you also don't want to travel to Japan, pay all this money, and not get to play a lot. Interesting how Nico, see Nico has two strokes here. He just played it to the right and said, uh, I'm getting second. I don't care, Paul. I'm sure you're going to park it, so I'm getting second no matter what. <laughs> and just it's just like that. Sometimes you have to make that strategy adjustment, pick your position, realize that somebody else is going to take the tournament. All I had left was to throw an ace for the crowd with a latitude disc, and I thought I'd give it a shot. Oh, that was close, I thought. He took, <laughs> he took it was a little bit long on the backside, but it was a great line nonetheless, and uh, going to have a look for ending on a birdie. And you want to end on a birdie. You want to leave Japan with... A good thought in your mind. Now, we talked about that shot he threw there. Um, you know, during practice, I said, Ricky, anything to the right, it's a W. It's a W. And every time we threw a practice shot that landed not in the bunker, that's a W, he said. That's <laughs> a W. <laughs> and so he did it. He played the smart layup, and uh, I'm proud of the kid. Yeah, he's going to lay up here, and uh, just like earlier in the year, going to get that. Uh, Ooh, that, that wind's tough. Foot. That wind <laughs> is tough. You're looking at, it looks like a left to right, so a right to left from your perspective. Three, only person to birdie 18 three times, Paul there. Paul, that's and you know that hurts when uh, the other time through he just took that unfortunate roll into the bunker. But that's why it's been a battle. That's why it's been a great season to watch with a lot of great players playing a lot of fantastic golf. Yeah, I mean the the level right now is really high. If if you don't come out and make all your putts, I didn't see Ricky miss but one putt in three rounds, in the last three rounds on the final nine. So if you're if you're not making them all, you're not winning right now. Yeah, let's talk about that. I mean, you've been on tour for a number of years now. You've seen players come and go. You've seen the levels change. What is it like competing against these kids nowadays versus, you know, when you were first getting on the tour? Well, when I was first getting on the tour, if you got hot with your putter and you had the driving skills of these kids like some of us did, you knew you won. 
Now you come to that card and there's three others who are doing the same thing that weekend. And it's kind of getting scary. Some of them had skills that they just could focus on and I knew I could get past it on certain courses, but they opened their minds and many of them like Ricky, you know, let me work on his backhand. Nico had me work on his, you know, spin putt. Stuff like that added things to their games where now they can score from every direction. They score side arm, backhand, putting, rollers. I mean, they're the complete package. I, I consider them the, the next generation of maybe, the, you know, it went Climo. Climo went to me and then I added some things to the game and now it's being passed from Avery's and the Dosses and me down to this generation. And they've added so much to their skill levels that if you want to be a top pro these days, you better learn all the shots and all the different angles. It's definitely more crowded at the top and like you're saying, these guys are complete players that it's very hard to find flaws. You've just got to kind of make it your weekend when you get the opportunity. And that's how golf's at. You know, you look at a golf tournament, they're all within 10 strokes. It should be about the best in the world and someone having a good weekend. And it's still a pleasure for me to be able to stand here with these young gentlemen on the screen. It's, it, it, you know, there's not so many more moments like this and the opportunity to, to be seen with these young kids and be a part of it. Uh, I understand how Climo felt back then when I was a kid. Well, definitely. It's uh, been a pleasure to watch this tournament. It's a pleasure to have you come and lend your insight, man. Thank you for stopping by. Thanks, James. I look forward to it and uh, keep watching Spin TV. That's right. Keep it locked. We've still got more videos to come from Japan. This will wrap up our tournament coverage, but we've got a couple extra featurettes you don't want to miss. This is Jamie Thomas, Dave Feldberg saying sayonara from the land of the rising sun.